absolutely glorious spring day we're having. The dandelions are popping. The very first big source of food for the bees every year. We do not put any fertilizer on our lawn, no weed and feed, nothing. And we get a lot of dandelions. Yes, and uh, I think it's beautiful. Absolutely stunning sea of yellow. I love it. Mm -hmm. And the bees are out foraging. We have some trees plant to plant, uh, things to do in the garden, and we thought we'd just do a day on the homestead. What are we getting done? Absolutely. I've seen cabbage moss flying I around already. Too. Yeah. So we're going to get our cabbages protected. We got our shipment from our local conservation district. That has arrived, so we got trees to plant. Yep. It's going to be a great day. It will be. It's stunning. I love it. <laughs> So while Todd digs the soil, you guys are in our orchard with us, and we have um, six apple trees, two pear trees. Uh, we've tried so many peaches. We have one peach tree that's, <clears throat> well two, one that I know is just rootstock, so it's never going to produce fruit. Um, one that we planted last year, it is blossoming. But this little spot right here, Todd is digging. We've attempted to grow a peach here three times. Well, this will be the third time. So I don't know if it's um, cursed and it's never gonna grow a peach tree right here, but we're gonna give it a try one more time. Um, there's no walnuts or anything. Oh, is this a walnut right here, Todd? No, it's oh, cottonwood. cottonwood. Yeah, there's no walnuts around that I think would hinder it. So I'm not quite sure what's doing it. But we're gonna give it a go. I got a Gloria peach, beautiful peach tree from the uh, conservation district and we're gonna get that planted. Just mixing in some peat and uh, vermiculite. It has some mycorrhiza in there um, to help amend the soil and just hold it, hold water. But I mean, it rained, what, three days ago now, and this is still really, really moist soil here. So yeah. I don't think water Good. retention is going to be a problem. Inch and a half of rain, yeah. yeah. Three days ago, two days ago. Spread out those roots. I don't really have a good place to meal. Do we got to keep this part right here above? Uh, no, up here, honey. Like, we want that there, yep. All right, I'll hold them. Why are you putting them so far back to the hole? Because as we all go this way. If you guys do not or have not bought trees from your local conservation district before, they exist all over. Just do a Google search for like the county where you live and conservation district. See if your county has an office. Hold on, let me move you guys. so windy today see if you guys have a local conservation district in your county and and check their website and see when they do their tree orders it's a great way to get natives to get native trees yeah. shrubs berry bushes all kinds of things for super super cheap they're basically kind of like government subsidized trees like this peach tree, I think, what did we pay, like $12 for this peach mm -hmm. tree? We went to Lowe's or Home Depot or somewhere or mm -hmm. any nursery Twice for that matter and tried to buy this. It would probably be like $28, yeah. $30 for yeah. this tree. Um, we have five pawpaw trees, for example, but we pay for all five of them, like $15 or something. Yeah. I mean, they are not anything like this size-wise. Very small. Yeah. But, but the whole point is, is... You really want to grow native species where you are um, because it's going to help bring in all the beneficial birds and insects that are necessary for your environment to thrive. And if you're just going to big box stores all the time to buy your trees, um, you might not be doing your, your local environment. Uh, actually, you could be doing harm instead of good. So we always try to do a really good job when we plant trees to make a good mental note of what it was that we planted where. But if we go down this line of apple tree, apple tree, apple, apple tree, pear tree, and go down the other line, Rachel has some, some pretty good guesses. In fact, I think she's positive on some. 
but not everyone. So one of the things we did this year was we made a map and all I used was the um, the Sheets app in, or not the Sheets, the, the Slides app on Google, Google Workspace to create a PowerPoint slide. And I kind of drew out our orchard and drew little circles for all the trees. And that way we can label everything going forward. In fact, we went back through and relabeled all of our blueberry plants that we planted based on what we know. So all future trees that we plant in our orchard will be put on that little map so that five years from now when our memory is worse than it is today, we'll have a good reference point and be able to look back on it. But even just a piece of paper, if, as long as you don't lose your piece of paper, it would be a good, good way to do that as well. So this, um, now we're about to plant two new grapevines. This grapevine was uh, transplanted here from my son and daughter-in-law's house that they purchased in town. It had a grapevine growing in the middle of the backyard and they didn't want it there. So we tried it. It has uh, produced fruit, but never the fruit yield to harvest yet. So um, for the first time ever this year, I tried to follow the instructions on pruning. Um, I, as you can see, I'm doing it two vines, trellising it here, um, and then I cut down to where there was two buds on each stem. And hopefully this year, I learned quite a lot from James Prigioni on managing grapes. So um, I'm putting some of his practices that he recommends to use. But I really wanted to show you this dandelion. Isn't that massive? I have some of the biggest dandelions here and this is a double-faced. Just growing naturally wild. A double-faced dandelion. So beautiful. Is my nose yellow? So we are going to get uh, about two concords. We're going to get those and plant them on the opposite sides of this grape and then Todd will eventually come out and build more trellis support for those. So I think these grapes came from Tractor Supply? Yep, Tractor Supply. Is that supply. where we got them from? Mm -hmm. Never bought nor never planted a grape except for the one that's back there that we got from our kids. Mm -hmm. And this is our soil, naturally. It's hard to tell because it's really wet from all that rain right now, but it's just sand. That is, I would say, what, probably 80% of our soil here. We do have some that is a better, like, loamy mixture, and then some that is really just solid clay. But for the majority, our soil is just sand. Dig down deep enough, you find clay. So I'm gonna put this back. Now, I don't know a ton, ton about growing grapes at all. Um, so I do wanna go research, like what specifically should I fertilize them with? They probably like a pretty balanced soil from an acidity perspective, right? I don't, I don't, you would assume so. They're fruiting, like, but I don't know. Then we'll use the grass top dressing. I always like to do that like upside down. Um, the grass, you know, will feed it as it decomposes and act, uh, hopefully you just keep a little bit of that weed pressure at bay at the same time. Do you guys see it? The white moth butterfly? Well, flying over there. Almost there. Our next trees have sadness and hope. <laughs> Sadness and hope. Sadness and hope. If you remember when we went to Alaska last fall, two of our souvenirs that we brought back were tiny little black spruce. And this is one of them. Didn't make it. So we're gonna use this spot, but we're gonna come this direction a little bit, about three or four feet, and plant a flowering dogwood in its place. Rachel absolutely fell in love with flowering dogwoods when you drove somewhere. Where was it? It was on the way to the cabin. And when there are like all these 
So here we have a problem. I'm sure lots of states have the problem because lots of states have outlawed them. Where everybody landscapes with Bradford pears and they're invasive and they compete with native um, plants and they drop the berries and the birds take the berries and then they just keep growing like wildflower fire. And we have flowering dogwoods are native to Michigan and I think a thousand times more stunning. They flower nearly the same time. So people just start planting flowering dogwoods. They are gorgeous. The blooms are so much more beautiful. They smell lovely. They don't stink like cat pee and like the Bradford <laughs> pears do. So um, driving on I-96 here in Michigan to the cabin, you see the flowering dogwoods and they're just stunning. So I'm like, I want them. I want them now. And one of our neighbors has one. Um, and I was just like, yes. But, okay, I'm standing in direct sun right now. They do prefer partial um, shade. So there is no partial shade here. So we're gonna try it. Todd has promised me if they don't work, I can buy more, but we're gonna try it. Because I want this is like right outside the house and I want like two really anchor focal points since we've cleared this whole area. And I think that this will be stunning. We should keep track again this year, how many trees we cut and how many trees we plant. Oh, yeah, what was the final tally last year? I don't remember. <sighs> But I know we, we planted more trees than we cut yeah, yeah. last year. Like twice as many or something. Mm -hmm. We still have a lot more that we want to cut down. There's still one, two, three, four, at least four giant box elder trees to come down. That's we, it though, huh? Once we get through those? Once we get through those, we are completely out of box elder trees, thankfully. We have a big giant mulberry up front that we need to cut because it's like, it's, metal. it's broken. It's a piece of old barbed wire from mm -hmm. a barbed wire fence. Mm -hmm. There used to be a barn about 20 feet that direction way back in the day. Our homestead is old, as, as many of you probably know by the name, 1870s. This has been around for- Long time. 150 some years almost, I think. There was, has been a homestead here. So there's been all kinds of buildings that have come and, and gone, gone <laughs> and come again and gone again probably. Um, but yeah, that's a piece of old barbed wire fence. I think it used to be an originally a 40 acre parcel of land when the person first homesteaded it back in the day. Mm -hmm. Good chickweed fertilizer. <laughs> yeah, in fact, right where Rachel's garden is, which I'm sure you guys have probably seen that many, many times, used to be a, a big giant two-story barn with a hay loft up in the top. Um, right where her garden is. Yeah. And I think it came down sometime in the in the eighties or the nineties, if I remember right. All right. All right. So the first one was um, anchoring the other side of the house, kind of more in front of the chicken coop, and the second one's coming here. And this is a big box elder that's coming down next to it, with some blackberries growing underneath it. I was just washing my hands off in the puddle. And I thought to tell you guys something, when you have standing water like this on your property and it's, you know, you're not spraying your lawn or anything like that. This is wonderful fertilizer for potted plants for your garden. A lot of times when I have young seedlings, I have a big pond behind my garden. I'll go fill it up and then that's what I water the garden with. Um, I'll fill up my watering can is what I meant to say. So this is just filled with delicious nutrients from, you could call it grass tea, whatever you want to call it. But it is just filled with life and minerals and just a wonderful option for you instead of running the hose out there in the early spring, make use of this. And if there's grass growing in it like this, it has a built-in washcloth you just run your fingers through. Well, clean. Next project is cabbage protection, yes. cabbage and broccoli. We've shown them many, many times before. These are the frames from the greenhouse, four by eight, two season greenhouses that you bought from a company called Gardner Supply Company. 
They did not give them to us for free. We paid money for them. We paid and a lot of money for them, like $220, I'll just be honest, for each. Yeah. Me. They're like 140 now. Oh, 140. Maybe yeah. I didn't pay 220 then. But maybe they went down 140 because they're not worth it. <laughs> <laughs> the, the frames are good. The frames, the frames are, are metal. Great. The couplings to connect the pieces together are good. But the fabric, the, the netting that zipped up over top of it, the zippers all broke within the first season. Yeah. We kept the frames because of what we're about to do next. And we're going to use them to put insect netting over top of our brassicas and hold it down with bricks. There's a gap in between them, which we just run some pieces of PVC conduit between the two things and zip tie them together to create a bridge between the two mm -hmm. because it's longer than the bed is longer than the, what the frames cover. And then we put netting. Yep. There's stuff right here over top of them. We're gonna put this up today. We may find holes in it. Todd thinks he might've seen some mouse got at it um, during the winter. And if we need to buy new, we'll buy new. But if we can reuse it, I'd like to reuse it. Yeah. Oh, get that clip. This one, metal one, or this, this one? one. All right, so I think there's one spot with a hole in it that we need to put tape on. Because Butterflies will find these spots. So I'm gonna go get some clear packing tape and I'll just put tape on it. I don't think it's worth buying new this year, but we'll have to put it in our mental notes to get a new piece for next year. And then I think we're using these clips. They're really handy. Um, I think I, Todd and I were talking, we might get, I used to use bricks to hold it down at the bottom, get some more clips and then we'll just clip it on at the bottom. And I think that should work. In the meanwhile, we will put this, at least two bricks here in the middle. Yeah? Yeah. Just there was nothing down. to clip it in the middle, right? Right, right. Come here though, while we're out in the garden, I want to show you a fun experiment I'm trying this year. Do, do you want to guess what's in my barrel? Maybe people know if they know what I've been growing along my fence row in my garden for some time. If you look behind me, it's peeking up out of the ground. Rhubarb. So we're trying our hand. I don't want to open it. Um, just when the rhubarb was coming up and it had the little nub on it, I don't know what you call those things. Um, in England, I guess they do this a lot in the UK, uh, something called forced rhubarb. And supposedly it yields a sweeter, more tender stalk. Um, and look it up on Google. It's some of the prettiest rhubarb you've ever seen. But you can only do it like, you have to give it a two year break after you do it. And this is my biggest plant. So I've set a tub, you want no light at all penetrating it so you couldn't have anything that's opaque. Um, we want just solid darkness. Got a couple bricks on it. And then like early June, I'll pull this off and we'll see what we have. So if you're not subscribed, subscribe so you can follow along for the big reveal. I think it's gonna be really fun.